All right, everybody. Welcome to the Inked Up Runner. Uh, this is be my first ever interview, um, and my first guest is uh, no no stranger to hard stuff. Um, he's he's done pretty much every every hard race I can think of around here in the southeast, uh, minus a couple. But uh, he's he's done everything from GDR to Strolling Gym to Ball State to um, Savage Golf Marathon. Um, he's he's done just a ton. Uh, so my guest today I'm going to have is, is Jeff Deaton. Thanks for being here, Jeff. Thanks. Being my guinea pig for my first ever interview. Uh -huh. um, so we're going to start out by just just uh, just a, just a brief little overview, or you know where where are you from, you know, and uh, you know kind of how did you get in the red? So I'm from a small town in northeast Tennessee called Elizabeth. And have you heard of that town? I have heard of it. Why, why, have it, why has anybody heard of Elizabeth? <laughs> you know what? When you work for the company that I work for, <laughs> and you open as many stores as we open up, we have a store in Elizabeth. So I have to give a, a plug to my wife on this one because the only thing Elizabeth is famous for is Jason Witten went to high school there. You gotta love Jason Witten. So every time I mention that, my wife says, yeah, you've only told me a million times. <laughs> Yeah, so that's where I grew up. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I I've I've been out there a few times, so I know the area. You know, I know it's it's close to what Bristol and mm -hmm. yeah, Bristol, yeah. the Tri City area. All right. So, so how did you get into running? Uh, that's a good question. So um, I grew. I had two brothers, so my parents had three boys, and we all played the traditional sports at that uh, back at that time: baseball, football, basketball. And my dad coached a lot of us, a lot of our teams. And then um, by the time I got to maybe the sixth or seventh grade, I figured out I'm not going to be big enough and fast enough and tall enough to, to be successful in any of those sports. But then I found out I had a little bit of ability for running, distance running. Pretty stubborn and uh, just, just like to torture myself probably. But um, So when I, when I got to high school, that's what I did was cross country and track. I quit basketball and all those sports. Um, but I ran cross country and track had some success. By the time I was a senior, I made All-State in cross country. Um, I think I was fifth in the state meet that year. Wow. And then I went on to college and ran in college, um, at least for a couple of years, and finally figured out that running's not gonna pay the bills and I need to figure out a career. So I, I gave up my scholarship and really focused on school. And um, so I stopped running for a really long time and um, eventually picked it back up just to get back in shape and stay healthy. And uh, then eventually, running with a friend of mine, David Robinson from Murfreesboro. He doesn't live here now, but we used to do some runs and we start running further and further and he said, hey, let's do a marathon. So back in 2013, we did the uh, Birmingham Marathon. Okay. I think it's in February. And I told him, I said, well, let's, I'm crazy, so let's, let's just do a marathon, but why don't we do one every, every month for four months? What the hell? So we signed up for the Birmingham <laughs> Marathon, Savage Golf Marathon, um, the music, the one in, Scenic City in Chattanooga was one of them. And then the last one, um, I can't remember what, oh, it was the one in the Music City one, I think it was in April back then. So we signed up for all four of those. So we ran the Birmingham Marathon, first marathon ever. And I think I ran three, 323 or something. I remember finishing the race and I could barely walk. Rigor mortis just set in. I, I, I could barely move because I've never run hard and you know for such a long period of time. And then, um, we, we got through that one and went well. We did Savage Golf Marathon. And I think that was the first year they had it, or maybe the second. Was that your first trail race? First trail race. So so let me, let's stop for a minute, folks. <laughs> All right, so he did his first trail marathon at Savage Golf. Okay, that's, that's insane. For anybody who's ran that race, um, it is incredibly hard. Probably, arguably, one of the hardest trail marathons. Probably, I would be willing to say on on in the on the East Coast. I mean, it's a tough race. It's not easy. No. I mean, anybody who's hiked out there and ran out there, been on that terrain, it's tough. And so you did Savage Golf. You obviously survived. How did I you do survived? I mean, I'm, we're running the race, and I'm still learning about ultras. I've never you know run for that many hours. I did this marathon in three hours and something, and now we're doing that one. I think it took me six hours and something. <laughs> yes. So it runs like a 50K, and I'm meeting all these people on the course, and I ran with uh, Tim Pitts out of Alabama. I think Ryan Pluckleman was at that race. That was, I think that was his first trail race as well. So uh, I didn't meet him at the race, but I remember after the race, I met Kerry Long, 
and uh, I think Ryan Carey was making fun of Ryan's shoes or something. So there's a whole story there. And uh, James uh, was there, and um, he's somebody I went to grad school with at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of people that were at that race that um, I've got a, a really strong friendship with now. But yeah, for my first trail race, though, I didn't I didn't know what to expect. I'm running fast early. I'm with a bunch of people I shouldn't have been with. Right. And later, oh my, I paid for it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, so that was marathon two. You yeah, two so, more. So I, I got through that one okay, and then we're training for I think the the one in Chattanooga, uh -huh. and um, just like stubborn ultra runners, I started having some pain in my my leg, and I find out later it was IT band. So I just ran through it. You know, it's gonna go away. It's just a little nagging pain. <laughs> And uh, we did the Moon Pie course twice in a training run, David Robinson and I did. And it hurt before I started. And I remember it just loosened up as I ran. And by the time I finished, I was just peg legged. I couldn't even bend my leg. And um, so I was out for a few weeks just letting that heal up and just trying to learn how to get over IT band. So I missed, I missed the next two marathons. And um, so I started getting back in shape. And that, then they had the Music City Trail Ultra that year, the first year they had that. I think it was in June and it was hot and there was horse flies in that race and I was not in very good shape but I decided I was going to try to do it. So I ran that race and I think I quit two or three times during that race so that's my first official ultra. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm so miserable in that race and I've made up my mind I get to this next aid station I'm done. And I get there and I sit down and I'm talking to them at the aid station and uh, they're like you're, what do you mean you're done? I'm like yeah I can't, I can't run anymore. We'll just sit down and drink some water and you know rest for a few minutes. So I did, and after about six or seven minutes, I made up my mind I was just going to keep going. Mm -hmm. So I got back up and somehow finished that race. So that's how they get you every time. Just just sit down a minute, have a drink. But, but every one of these races is a learning opportunity, and that one I learned. No matter how that was a low spot, probably twenty minutes later, I'm singing a song and just running along a trail and just back on a high so no matter how low you get it's you're not always going to get worse it's going to get better right and i think that's i think that's a, a an important thing that a lot of people who who run these these ultra races you you go through that progression where things are going great you're on top of the world you know you're cruising right along and then you know you'll hit the you know i know the, when i ran my first ultra which i think was yamacra it was terrible. It was snowed. It rained. It was flooding. We had to jump across rafts. Um, you know, it was just. It was a. But I remember multiple times where I was just like, mm -mm, "I'm done." And then I got to like the marathon part of it, and then I was like, "Well, hell, I mean, I've only got you know five more miles at this point, right? I can grind it out." And so at this point, you're just grinding it out, you know, and 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 you know. But by the time I ended it, I was good. And I was excited that I finished it. You know, I was glad I didn't throw it in yeah. the towel. So, so, so that's cool. So, I, so I guess so I, was, so I was doing that race, and I'm right before I got to that aid station to quit. You're coming down a jeep road and to the bottom of this hill, and then there's like a lollipop part of the course where they loop back. This guy comes flying up the hill, which I find out later is Zach Miller. <laughs> so he's coming up the hill, and he stops, and I'm just miserable. I feel like I'm dying. He says, "Hey, am I going the right way?" I, I have no idea. And I talked to him. I, yeah, I think so. I think you go back this way, but I'm not sure. He runs up the hill about 50 yards and turns around and runs all the way to the bottom and passes him. <laughs> and then he turns around and runs back up the hill again. And he's probably you know at mile 20 or 25, and he's running like a sprinter. And yeah, that uh, guy's amazing. Anyway, so you you know who he is. I know who Zach Miller. That was my my little one-on-one uh, -on -one time with him. That's right. Before he became really famous. Before he became a big deal, right? So, so you did the Music City Trail Ultra, and I guess my thing is, like, moving from the marathon to the 50K, like, did you change your training up, or did it basically look the same? Were you, when you went to the Ultra, the Music City Ultra, were you, like, training on, like, trails, or were you just mainly just still, like, doing, like, just regular, like, road training and stuff like that? Yeah, I started running more trails. Um, Jeff Davis and James uh, in Nashville kind of introduced me to the Percy Warner Trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would do red, white, and blue, and especially for the hilly races, just do red loops. Um, like even when eventually I did GDR and some of the, even uh, Barkley Fall Classic, I would live on the red loops, you know, on the weekends, just go out there and do as many of those and really just get used to that up and down and 
trash in your quads and uh, just to be ready for that kind of abuse in the race. Oh, absolutely. And so, you know, thinking about GDR, GDR runs a lot like a 100 miler from what I understand. I obviously never ran GDR. I hope to run GDR at some point, but uh, that's, uh, for those who don't know, GDR is a Georgia death race. It's put on down in Georgia. It's an extremely tough technical race. Um, at one time, it was a, it was a Western States qualifier. Uh, so it's it's extremely tough race. Um, so you you got into GDR, you, you did that. Like, how did you how did you you know? I guess and I'm I'm jumping around a little bit, but how did you how did, so training for GDR? You basically just did loops around Percy Warner. That and um, I went out to Frozen Head a few times because I knew the the climbs at GDR were pretty long and steep, and then I, I hadn't really been to Frozen Head much, but. I knew about the Barkley marathons and had gone out there to train a few times. So I went out there maybe three or four times to train for GDR. And in fact, I think my last long run, um, so GDR is like in March. So I think probably the end of February, I'm finishing a run out there. I think I did 25 or 30 miles and uh, I run into Laz and his wife and some of the others. They were putting books out for the, the real Barkley marathons <laughs> that were coming up in about a month. And um, I remember him asking me, He's probably trying to just get me to tell him I went off course on the places you're not supposed to go. But he asked me, did you, yeah, did you go over to Testicle? Did you do any of those hills out here? And I'm like, no, I stayed on the Mark Trails. The Mark Trail, yeah. The Candy Ash Trails, he calls yeah, them. Yeah, the, 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 the easy ones, right? But, but Frozen Head was a great simulation for GDR. Yeah, yeah um, I, I heard GDR was real, real technical and just extremely steep, steep climbs and whatnot. There's no switchbacks. It's just... You just climb. You just climb. Yeah, I heard it's extremely tough. So I guess the question is, is you know, before we get into some of your harder races, you you started out with Savage Golf. You moved to Music City Trail Ultra, which that's not a gimme either. Um, I know people who ran it and said it's it's not exactly easy. You know, you ran GDR. We'll get in some of the other ones you ran later. What's the allure of running these easy races? Like I know for me. You know, I went with Yamakra because I heard it was a great, you know, easier, easier for 50k, you know, just to kind of break myself in. But you like just you just like went straight in, like you're just like let me find the hardest stuff and let me just do it all, you know. So what was like, like, or do you just like to like put yourself through a lot of pain? I mean, what 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 is you know what 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 is it? My wife would probably say yes. Um, so I think. Um, I think it's just by chance that the ones I didn't know anything about trail running, and I think I saw some results of the races they were having in Chattanooga that Randy Horton's group was doing, and um, so that's how I kind of learned about trail running. And then I think just some of the first few races that I learned about were some of the really hard ones, and I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll go do that one. I think that sounds fun. And then you get out there and it's like, wow, this is really hard. This is really hard because you you've done you've done up, Chuck. And uh, you know, I, I have uh, some friends who've done up Chuck, other friends who've done up Chuck as well, and they 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 say it's a very tough race. And it's more like a, from what I understand, it's like one of the OG yeah. ultra races in Chattanooga, and it's extremely tough. And so you you've done that one, and you know, um, so so you just like those are what you learned as new ones, and so you just like that's just what I'm going to do. Yeah, um, Upchuck's a great old school race. Um, you know, it's very low key. You come up and they they know your number, so they take a grease pencil and write it on your leg. There's no bibs. There's no bibs. Aid stations are pretty minimal, and uh, but the the really the unique thing about that it draws some really good runners. Oh yeah. So you they only have as many people as they'll fit on a school bus because they shuttle you from the finish to the start. And that's how they limit how many people, how many people's in the race is how many fit on a bus. Right, and the race director dresses up, right? Yeah. So Matt Sims, um, he's the he's the RD that rest, dresses up as Ray J, I think. Ray J, uh, yes. His his moniker. But I actually knew him from college when I went to school in Chattanooga, mm -hmm. and had no idea he was going to end up doing stuff like that. But that's a really fun race. But the the, the runners are really really good. So um, it's kind of it's kind of misleading. You think it, you know, maybe some of these guys are just out there to have fun, but they're they're pretty serious. So. Oh yeah, you got your Nathan Holland showing up out there, and those guys they don't play around. Yeah. It, it it's funny because you know Nathan, I was like reading his results from Strolling Gym, and he was like, "That's a whole lot of road," because <laughs> uh, he's wearing a Strolling Gym shirt. That's why that's the year I ran it. It's the only year I ran it. So you run Strolling Gym a lot. 
you, you run the Barkley Fall Classic. We'll get into that one uh, in a minute. So do you have any desires to ever do Big Barkley? Um, I don't know. A lot of people have asked me that before. And um, I think every, I've done BFC the last four years. Mm -hmm. I'm in it again this year. I was fortunate enough to get in again. Every time I'm out there running that race, I'm thinking there's no way in hell I'm ever doing the big race. Because this is, this is maybe similar to, not even similar to one loop in the real race. It's such a grueling course, especially uh, rat jaw and testicle spectacle. And if the weather's really hot, those those climbs are just brutal. Yeah, I, I've only been out there one time and it was recent. Um, and we did the fire, the fire tower climb from uh, Old Mac. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember thinking this thing <laughs> is steep. I think you climb like, I don't know, several thousand feet in like just a few miles. And so I'm thinking, if this is just what this looks like, I can't, and then you get up to the top where Rat Jaw is and it's just like, I couldn't imagine having to go up that thing two or three times and then having to go back down and then back up it. So, but I thought of that when I was noticed how many times you ran the Barkley Fall Classic. Because there's several people who you see every year running the Barkley Fall Classic and you think to yourself, oh, are they ever going to try to go mm -hmm. for the big Barkley? So, but that's just one you just enjoy doing. I mean, that, it, that's a great race. Um, the culture of that race, and you know, it's got some tie to the real race, and it's on some of the trails, and you do some of the signature climbs. Um, plus, it's just really difficult. So I, I really, I really like that race. It's a, it's a fun one. So, so I guess like when you're preparing for something like that, I guess you go out there and you probably do some training out there and whatnot. Like that one doesn't really have any of the limitations though. Is of the big Barkley though, right? You can have your GPS watch. No, you no, can't. no GPS. No GPS watch at that no. one either, right? No GPS watch. No gel packs. They try to keep the litter down on the trails. So they do have a few, a few rules. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if I have any desire to run that one either. Um, but that one's that one's definitely a good one. So you 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 did all those, and then when I've left off intentionally, I wanted to hit on is you did Ball State, and you just didn't do Ball State. You did like the hard version of Ball State, right? You did the Ball State. Most of you don't know what Ball State is. Ball State pretty much runs through almost the whole state of Tennessee, right? And uh, you start it from one end, and you run down south to another end of it, and so. Um, so Ball State, uh, he did, and there's two versions. There's the aided version, and then there's, which is called the screwed, and it, right? Well, the crew. Well, the crew. Yeah, and then the unaided version is the screwed. screwed. Version. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> so you did the screwed version. So, so you just decided you wanted to do that one, and I mean, you just, tell your family, you come in, your wife one day, hey, I want to run from one end of Tennessee to the other. How did that conversation go? Yeah, so that, that race, so they, they describe it, you go through five states. So you start in Missouri on the other side of the Mississippi and you come back into Kentucky. Then you get into Tennessee, then you go into, I guess, Alabama for a bit, and then you cross over into Georgia at the finish. So they, you know, that's one of the big things is five states. And, um, but yeah, that, so I did, um, I did the Bitter End 100, which was a fat ass that Laz was in. Laz was trying to get, I think, his 30th 100 miler, 30, 30 years consecutive 100 miler, and he needed to have some people do it with him, so I ended up doing that, and I think there were maybe 12 or 15 of us that did it, and it was in, up in um, the northeast part of the state where I'm from. So I did that race, and then later that year I did ARFTA, Mm -hmm. a race for the ages right. and it was the first year they did that in Manchester and um, so around all that I started seeing these people wearing these blue jackets and Ball State and it's you know, it's a weird name last annual Ball State well what is that I start looking at it and I remember my wife came to ARFTA and we're during one of the meals we're sitting at the table and Laz was with us and he says something to her about has he been talking about running Ball State yet and I'm sitting there, how does he know I'm thinking about running Ball State? I'm, I'm starting to learn about all these races. And I'm like, yeah, that one seems that one seems like a challenge. It's 314 miles in July across Tennessee on asphalt. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so the very next, so I, I had signed up that winter and did it the next year. And um, but that, that was, that's one of those races where you're like, wow, it's going to take me a week to finish that. That's a huge time commitment. I've got work. I've got family. I've got to take vacation from, mm -hmm. from all that. 
and you know, there's there's a lot of guilt in being an ultra runner anyway with the, the hours of training right, and races absolutely. and so um, so I talked to my wife and just one of those things it's like there's never a good time to do that so just do it just do it right? yeah. so I signed up and and knew nothing about it I remember reading some race reports and getting John Price's book and all these things about Ball State and just trying to learn and um, that that race is just like it's your whole, you, they say 100 miles or your life in an entire day. Vault State's your life in, you know, six to 10 days or whatever <laughs> long it takes you to finish because you're, you just turn into an animal in the course if you don't have a crew. You're just looking for food, water, and where are you going to sleep next? That's it. No, there is no outside world other than that. You're just trying to keep going down the, the white line down the road. So, like, what, so, like, preparing for that, like, what, what did, what did your preparation look like for Ball State exactly? Yeah, so I studied as much as I could to figure out what, what do I need to carry. And if you're in the screw division, you don't want to carry as little as possible because you imagine just something that weighs a pound or whatever, right, carrying that 314 heavy. miles yes. is a huge load. So I, I did as much research as I could to figure out how would I run the race. And then I think that one's like what Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. Well, the first day you get punched in the face in that race, so you can just forget your plan. <laughs> Um, but, but then in training, I uh, so live in Murfreesboro, I drove my car to McMinnville a few times and also to um, uh, up in DeKalb County. What's the name of the town up there? Well, um, up north a little bit. But I drove up there and dropped my car off early in the morning and I'd run home. So I think the one from uh, DeKalb County um, is about 30 miles to the house. And then from McMinnville, it's about 45 miles. So just drive up there early in the morning on a weekend and run home. And uh, that kind of got me used to running to a gas station and getting some food and just getting used to that kind of distance on your feet. And those were kind of some of the training runs I did. Wow. Yeah. So, like, I guess, like, you know, when you're, when you're looking at that, when, when you think about that, too, it's kind of like a through hike on asphalt minus carrying all the stuff, right? Because yeah. when you're through hiking or you're section hiking or whatever that looks like, you know, you pretty much have to go from one, you know, you're pretty much just... You know, you have to find a place to sleep. You have to find you have to find something to eat, especially if you're you know. So that's pretty much what it's like. And so, I guess like so, how did that go? I mean, did you did you hit like any like, you know, were you, you know, were there any areas where you were like got like scared or worried or like hit some extremely bad lows? You know, you know, what did that look like? Yeah, that race I've I've done it twice. The second year I, I made it about a hundred miles and I DNF. I had a, a tendon issue in my ankle and decided I was you know, wasn't worth risking injury. So, uh, but the first the first year I did it, which I think it was 2016, um, I had no idea what I was up against with that course. But so I thought the first day I'm going to run as much as I can, and then that night I'm going to try to sleep somewhere. And um, so. The heat of the day, I think it got up to 95 that very first day, and you're just on asphalt and going and going and going, and um, you really need to be cons a little bit conservative the first day and kind of get used to the rhythm of the race and figure out what you should do. So I remember going that night, trying to sleep somewhere outside, and I'm one of these people that's a very light sleeper, so I didn't get any rest. I was laying down, but I didn't sleep. So. Then through the next day, so I think I did maybe 65 or 70 miles the first 24 hours. And then by the next day, I still haven't gotten any quality sleep and I'm just miserable. It's the heat of the day and if you're outside, you can't sleep. Mm -hmm. So um, eventually I got a hotel at maybe mile 100. I got a, got a shower, got some real sleep and I felt like a new person again. And so that became my thing. During the day, I'll try to find a hotel and get out of the, get out of the heat and get the air conditioning and rest. And then at night when it's cool, that's when you need to make as many miles as you can on that course. So that's that's really the, the thing I ended up doing. And uh, there's so many experiences from a race like that. You can imagine how many different things you encounter and really the, the kindness of people, the road angels that are on that course, mm -hmm. they're incredible. We, we had a day, we made it to the Natchez Trace, I think uh, maybe around four in the morning at a campground and we didn't have any food with us. It was me and another couple of guys that we were, I was running with. So we got up when the sun came up and started, and you have to go all the way to Columbia, really, to the, to the next place where there's something available. And it's the heat of the day on this huge four-lane asphalt, no no shade. Mm -hmm. But when we were just out of, we had, we had nothing. We found a cooler on the side of the road with some nice, some drinks, some Gatorade or something. 
some lady was driving the course and gave us a few things and without that we we would have never we would have never finished that race yeah i would actually had heard people talk about how their shoes actually melt on the asphalt because the asphalt is so hot sometimes I think somebody's measured it. Like, if it's 95 or so degrees, the asphalt's like 130 or something. Like it's really crazy. So, so you when you when you finish that one, you know, uh, how long did it take you to do that one? Six days. Um, so six and a half days, something wow. like that. That's crazy. That's that's amazing. I couldn't even imagine that. So, so you finished that one. Yeah, and you you did. You finished it the first time you did it, and yeah. you DNF the second time. You have any desire to do it again? Uh, maybe. I don't know when I would devote that much time to something like that again, but not in any time soon, probably. Yeah, I don't. I don't blame you there. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, I would like. I think for me, I would be more interested in like the, you know, like running like from one trail to another. Mm -hmm. You know, like you know, like doing, you know, like like an Appalachian Trail style thing, but something much smaller, you know, like Scar or the Benton McKay yeah. Trail, something like that, you know, but not across the state of Tennessee on asphalt. I heard that's just, just <laughs> miserable. So I saw somebody posted a picture, somebody, somebody sitting on the bench of despair, you know, out there, you know, it just, it just seems so difficult, uh, but, but, but that's so cool. So you did all that stuff. Um, and then you, one race that I know that is extremely difficult. Um, I know a lot of people that's done it, and that's that's been Honey, Alabama. Um, so you you you've done it a couple of times, right? I did it three times, yeah. Yeah, so you, you you've done Penhody a few times, and that's an extremely difficult race. You finished each time you've done it. Uh, two times. Two. One one time I had some kind of hip problem bursitis or something and I, I i couldn't hardly walk on it so i ended up quitting at 65 miles wow, that's crazy so but you still finished it i mean you still ran, finished it two other times yeah. and so uh, for those who don't know pin is an extremely hard uh 100 mile down in alabama it's also what's considered a western states uh, qualifier where you get a ticket western states is like the super bowl of trail racing trail running like everybody who's anybody wants to run western states if you trail run for the most part i mean i would like to run western states um, it's just an amazing experience the course the grandeur all of it so so jeff's been running pinho he's got some tickets how many tickets did you have so i i, I applied for western states uh five years in a row five consecutive years and so each year it's exponential as how many you get so i think i had maybe 16 or something so 16 tickets and they, they drop the tickets in. A, it's a lottery style situation. They, they drop the tickets in and then they draw names. And um, it's very hard to get into Western States, like extremely hard. Um, Jeff got into Western, Western States. And so he's running Western States in this year, uh, in June. And so you were supposed to run it last year, right? So you're supposed to run it last year, but we all know what happened last year. And so he, he got moved to this coming year. And so I guess were you relieved last year? Or were you disappointed last year that you didn't get to do it? What was the thought process for last year? So I, you know, so I had like a 9% chance of getting in even with 16 tickets and uh, somehow I got drawn. And so that, that's probably my only luck. And then last year, my training was going really well for Western States. I was doing shorter, faster stuff, getting really fit, and then I was gonna just build miles and uh, hopefully that would prepare me for the race. And um, of course we know what happened, and mm -hmm. so that ruined my whole year. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so that was a, I did a few other races anyway, but then for this year in January, I was doing the same thing. And somehow I got some real bad tendonitis in my ankle and got to where I couldn't run. So I've, I've been struggling with an injury this year, off and on. I just had another setback probably three weeks ago, which I'm, I'm, I think I'm almost completely over now. I'm about to ramp my miles back up. So last year, I think I would have run great at Western States. I was fit, fast, strong. This year, I'm just hoping to finish and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully get to the starting line healthy. That's, that's really my goal because you know, the race is next month. I'll probably get 30 miles this week, would be my guess. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm a little bit anxious about that. Hey, I, I, have, a, I have a friend, and his motto was show up, blow up. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, but 
I guess the thing is, is preparing for something like that. We got a totally different terrain here in Tennessee than they do out there. I mean, we got steep mountains up there in in, in California that you're going to be running through. Um, you know, here it's it's a lot of a different style of terrain. So how are you preparing for Western states? Like, what's what's your training looking like for that? Yeah, so as long as I can stay healthy, I'll, I'll start to build my long runs and do some back-to-back -back long runs at least every other weekend. Um, but I'll, I'll live out of Percy Warner as much as I can. Red, white, and blue, I think that, that kind of um, mixture of, you know, runnable versus climbs and descents, I think that's probably a really good simulation for that. It doesn't have the real steep, long climbs that I'll have that you'll have at Western States, but I think that I think that'll be sufficient to, to train for it. But you know, Western States, I think the first probably 30 miles is the most difficult. You, know, you climb and you're in the snow and ice, and uh, eventually you start to come back down and get into um, a lot of less technical, more runnable stuff. And eventually, though, you're in the canyons, and um, you know it's over 110 degrees some years down in the canyons. So for for most years, it's a hot weather race. So so I'll I'll, I'll train like I would for a normal ultra that's a hundred miler, get lots of trail miles, and just really beat up the quads. But I'm also going to do some sauna training and, and try to run in the heat of the day when I can. So um, so that I'll be ready for the the heat acclimation part. So are you doing any training out west at all, or are you just all strictly out here? So I am. I'm in the. I'm, I signed up for the Western States training camp that's at the end of this month. Yeah. So Memorial Day weekend, I'll fly out there Friday, and then Saturday we run 30 to 60 miles on the, of the course, so mm -hmm. a 30 mile day. And the next two days you run 20 miles each, so you run the last 70 miles of the course. So I'm going out there. I'm hoping I'll. I'm hoping I'll be fit enough and healthy enough to at least survive that. And if I can do that, then I'll. I'll, I'll be confident about the race. You taking a big crew with you? No, um, so for the training runs, just myself, but then for the race, uh, my wife and kids are going to go out there, and um, it's really hard to crew for states, especially when you got got, got children with you, so um, we'll, we'll stay at the starting line in a condo there, and I'll start the race. They'll check out, maybe come meet me halfway through the race, I think Michigan Bluff or a few other places you can, it's easy to get to, so hopefully I'll see them there, and then they'll just meet me at the finish line. So yeah, I, so you're I'm basically going to be doing this crewless. Yeah, so I've I've used crews before early when I was doing hundred milers, and uh, I've gotten to the point now where I, I I enjoy doing it solo, just doing it on my own, and uh, just trying to troubleshoot with my you know problems myself and figure out what I need to do. Um, there's been some like at Penhody a couple of times when it's late at night or you're not eating enough and you don't really know what's going on with your body you just know you're slow and sluggish then you know having a having somebody pace me to tell you to eat or drink would probably be helpful but um yeah that's 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 my plan for this summer but but why do that when you can just do it the hard way and just <laughs> like whatever let me just run one of the hardest races and toughest races and let me just do it just kind of by myself and to see what happens right <laughs> right so 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 you have that coming up in June. You got you got you got you said the fall classic in the in the fall. Um anything after that? I mean any any long term plans after Western States? I mean any other I mean if you you looking for anything, you know, when 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 you start talking about races like Western States, races like Hard Rock comes into my head, races like Leadville, and let's face it, if if, if Jeff Deaton can do all these other races. Surely you can do Leadville or Hard Rock. Have you thought about trying to get into those? Yeah, I, 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 at some point I want to do Cruel Jewel and um, Grindstones, another one that I've kind of got on my list. And those are qualifiers for Hard Rock, which Hard Rock's another one of these lottery races. It's really difficult to get in. But, but that would be one I would try to do once in my life, maybe. Um, so that, that might be something I'll consider. But yeah, I'll get past Western States and then I'll just reevaluate it and see. But I haven't really thought past that. <laughs> I haven't thought about much. No. Well, that's enough. I mean, you know, when you're thinking about when you're thinking about preparing for a race like that, you really it's hard to get past that. I mean, unless you're like Jim Walmsley or one of these other guys that just goes out and wins it every year, you know. Um, but like so, so, um, so that's awesome. You're going out for the crew camp and in the races at what the end of June, mm -hmm. right? And do you know if it's like, is it like a, going to be a full field or is it a reduced field? Have you heard anything about that? 
So I, I think they're planning on the full field, but I don't know what all the rules are going to be. There's certainly going to be some restrictions, um, but I was concerned that at the end of the, the end of May whether they would have the training camp or not. And um, I actually asked them on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, and they said absolutely it's on. So I don't know what the restrictions are going to be. Um, I've, I've had both of my shots and been vaccinated. Yeah, and you should be that was one of the things they talked about is maybe all the runners have to be vaccinated. So at least I, I did that. But I don't. It's going to be a full field. But I just don't know what the rules are going to be. Yeah. Well, that's that's good. I mean, in the most races, I think for the most part are getting back to normal. Mm-hmm. I mean, you saw because it was strolling gym. Yeah was back to normal and I remember what last year there was an abbreviated much low-key version of strolling gym that only select few I think you ran, I ran it. you you ran the low-key limited edition VIP version of strolling gym last year so which that was fun because um, and that's something I learned about strolling gym so you had to have a crew I've never had a crew at strolling gym I, the, I ran it five times I think the first year I wore my best and I was training for Thunder Rock which was the same month and I had no idea what to expect, and I think I'd done a 30 miler out at um, um, Spantown Road. If you've run that in yes. those hills before, yes, I know Spantown. I did a triple out there the weekend before um, Strolling Gym, and um, so I wore my best that race and somehow survived. And then so I've done it, you know, just carrying a water bottle every year and <laughs> just getting whatever I can at the aid stations. But I did it last year and had to have a crew, so my wife and kids came out. That was awesome. They're handing me Gatorade and yeah. anything I want and. And I ran my fastest time, so I'm like, okay, on that course, a crew makes a huge difference. You're not stopping, and they just hand you stuff as you run by, and that, so that's my plan there. I want to, if I run it again, I want to have a crew. That's, that, that's what a crew does, Jeff. I know you don't, <laughs> you, you don't have one, but just FYI, it's what a crew does. I remember my crew handed me pizza, you know, which was very nice when I did my, you know, when I attempted my hundred. So that's cool. So most of the time, it's just your family crew, and you know, right? And you got you got kids and and whatnot. I mean, is that I guess is can that be challenging from time to time, and, or does it, does it go pretty pretty smooth? Yeah, that race it, it wasn't any big deal. So my wife, uh, my first hundred miler, Thunder Rock, back in two thousand fourteen, I think. Her and James uh, and uh, David Robinson were crewing for me, and that one I DNF'd at seventy five with IT band, which was when all the I was dealing with all that a lot, um, but. You know, that, that one was a, a great race. A lot of people, a lot of friends of mine, that was the first year for the Thunder Rock. A lot of people ran it, and um, so me not, not finishing that race, that was devastating. I had this crew there, and they're counting on me and all this stuff, and you know, they commit, they spent their weekend with me, and I stayed up all night driving around on the, this mountain, and um, the logistics to get to the crew spots, since it was the first year of the race, it didn't go all that well. And, um, there was lots of bottlenecks and traffic and people frustrated around all that. I actually missed my crew, I think, at mile 50. And uh, right before I had the IT band this year, start, we're heading up on Star Mountain. And it was starting to get cold that night. And uh, I'm still running great. I'm way ahead of the pace I wanted to be. And um, so I'm, I'm, I missed my crew. And that's when I was supposed to get my first pace for David Robinson. And um, so and I was going to get some clothes because I was going up on the mountain. Well, they weren't there. So I just, I ate something. Uh, I think Scott Bell made a quesadilla for me. I ate it and I took off because I'm, I was just in on a mission. Right. You were just in the zone. About three or four or five miles later, I couldn't, couldn't run anymore because of the IT band. Uh-huh. And, and before I knew it, I got so cold. I was really close to being hypothermic, teeth chattering and just, you know, just couldn't stop shivering. So I got to the next aid station, got in the car, they were there, and turned the heat on, heated seats, and put on a bunch of clothes, and ate some, drank some hot soup, and I think after about 20 minutes, I felt normal again, and so I put on a bunch of clothes, and James Sun and I went on, and um, we ran for probably two or three miles, and then it just came back even mm-hmm. worse than before, and I barely could limp to the next aid station at 75, but, so that was, a, that was another learning experience, but yeah, the, having that crew there, there were a lot of help, but at the same time, I felt like I let them down, and I didn't really, I don't really know, that commitment to me just is hard. I don't know that I want to put people through that. Right, you're, you're, you're more just like the type of person that's just like, hey, this is this is me, this is all me, I want to handle business myself, and I don't want to put put it on anybody. Cause I, I know how you feel. I mean, two years in a row, I've, I've DNF'd at, at, at a 100 mile race, and I brought out a bunch of people, and I know what you're saying. It, it's hard because you, 
you know, you all these people put all this work into helping you out, and then you know, then you feel like you you've let them down by not succeeding. Yeah. You know, so it, it's definitely tough. So I definitely understand that. So, um, so um, I guess you know we're we're I guess we're toward the end of the interview, but I guess to, to close it out, you know, what are some of the you know you've done a lot of hard races, you've done a lot of hard stuff, you know. What sort of tips would you have for people who want to get in, this, you know, who, who want to, to, to attempt these hard runs, you know, like, you know, like a Penhody or like, you know, like Savage Golf. And I don't know if Savage Golf is even, even happening right now. I, I know they're having issues with that race, but, you know, even Strolling Gym, for example. Uh, I mean, these, these, are, these are not just easy type races. Um, so like, you know, you know what is you know what what are some things that some of the things that you hold close to you that that are things that work for you yeah i think uh the the big thing is just build your mileage up and get used to those long runs and find some nutrition that works for you and definitely find some shoes that work and don't cause blisters and i've, I've been through lots of issues with shoes and finally found something that works for me and everybody's different you know somebody will, oh you're wearing those shoes well that's what i'm gonna get well they may not work for you <laughs> So, you know, experiment with all these things and find stuff that works for you, lubrication and, you know, there's, there's lots of stories about, about people that don't do the right things there. And, uh, um, but ask, ask for lots of advice too, you know, when you're going to do a race, try to find out people that's running before, get some advice about how the course is. And uh, the big thing is just, just go out and try, these, try the smaller ones, <clears throat> get comfortable with that and then move up to the bigger stuff if that's what you like to do. Right, so that's that's great advice. I think I think that's that's critical. Curious, what what shoes do you run in? What trail shoes you run in? So I switched to ultras um, maybe four years ago. I was having a lot of calf problems, and um, I think around November of one year, I just decided I was going to switch. And since it's a zero drop, you know, it takes a period of time. So I kept my miles real low that winter, and I, you know, got my calves used to that. And since then, I haven't had any problems. Um, I do have a God, what's it? An neuroma in my foot. Mm -hmm which I found at uh, ARFTA. Um, basically, it's an overuse thing that, you know, it's a nerve issue in your foot. Um, but at that point, I started going to the, some of the Maximalist type shoes, some of the Hoka's, but eventually I switched to Ultra. And uh, for the really, like the 100 milers and, and beyond, I wear the uh, Olympus. I That's what I wear. The Olympus is a great shoe. But the shorter Ultras, the 50Ks and maybe even 50 miler, the um, Lone Peaks work for me really Lone well. Lone Peaks, that's a great shoe. BFC, that's a great shoe for BFC. The grip's good, um, but that, those are the two shoes. That I that's, 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 that, that's a great shoe, and I think that's good advice. I mean, I watch a, a guy who through hikes, and he's kind of a rough guy. He's got a big beard, and he's, he's, he's working on doing the Triple Crown, and he's kind of he just kind of speaks his mind, and he's real funny because he's no nonsense, and He's like, you know, he's walking and he's talking and he, he, while he's hiking and he says, you know, all you guys ask me what kind of stuff I use and he didn't use the word stuff. And he said, and he said, I'm not going to tell you. He said, because this is what works for me. He said, you've got to find out what works for you. And he said, the key is like what you said is figuring out what it is to get into your rhythm and get going and then, and then getting there. So, um, so anyway with that i think we've we've spent a ton of time talking thank you for doing this thank you for being my very first interview um I, i've really enjoyed it um so we're going to be keeping an eye on, on jeff uh, see how he does at western states and so um, that's it this is uh jason and uh, i'll see you on the trail